My first encounter with sacramental theology was pretty negative. I was 13 years old and part of a confirmation class in a suburban church in the far south of Sydney. We were working through a booklet version of the Catechism. I have to confess that the only part of the booklet that I remembered was the opening line, what is your name? <laughs> N or M? And sadly, the only memory I have of the classes conducted as a monologue by the vicar relate to the terrible errors of the Catholics. Apparently, their priests put one hand on the Lord's table when they proclaimed God's blessing because they superstitiously believed that some sort of spiritual power arose from what they erroneously called the altar. I presume that the idea was that this spiritual power passed up through the priest's body and out his hand to the people. I remember our vicar's demonstration of this shocking error, which sort of um, ironically uh, confirms the opposite, doesn't it? Uh, the instantiation of his actions imprinted themselves deeply in my, uh, in my uh, being. Anyway, uh, and I remember too his method of avoiding this error by standing well away from the table, hands full in view. Neither would you find our vicar making the sign of the cross when he pronounced the blessing. Having his hand up in the air merely signalled a goodbye. What I didn't grasp at that point, at the age of 13, was that the attack wasn't just directed to the Roman Catholics down the road but also to what was then known as Anglo-Catholicism. Fast forward to the 21st century, indeed a mere five years ago, and an ordination in the major, a major metropolitan diocese. In this particular diocese, there are two Anglican theological colleges, one evangelical and reformed, and the other appealing to what it names as the broad Catholic Anglican tradition. At the service I attended, there were candidates for ordination to the priesthood from each of these institutions. As you may know, during the service for the ordination of priests, the bishop is joined by the priests present in the laying on of hands and in the invocation of the Holy Spirit on those being ordained. What utterly shocked me at this particular ordination was that the church spectacularly displayed its party divisions. Each college presented its own candidates and party adherents then joined the bishop in the laying on of hands. So evangelical clergy joined the bishop in laying on hands for evangelical candidates while Catholic clergy joined in for Catholic candidates. At each alternation, there was a swift move away by the members of the other party. Wouldn't want to authorize the wrong candidate. Well, why am I telling you these stories? First, because I believe that what we have here at St. Mark's is very special. We continue to uphold and value Anglican diversity. We haven't signed up to an ecclesiastical party we have evangelical and Catholic students and staff among us, and every shade between. This is a good thing for our mission of transforming lives and communities for Jesus Christ, not for our own party. But second, and much more importantly tonight, these stories highlight the necessity and value of Brian's scholarship in the area of sacramental theology in general and Eucharistic theology in particular. It is work that is both ground clearing and ground breaking. Ground clearing because there has been so much prejudice and ignorance locking us into unproductive party political battles that has needed to be swept out of the way ground breaking because once we have swept away our presuppositions and prejudices, 
we find that there are new ways for us to think and talk about the sacraments. Tonight we have had a wonderful taste of Brian's careful, important scholarship. We have allowed ourselves to listen with him to the rich, nuanced, Eucharistic theology of Edward Bovary Cusi. We have been taken on a journey beyond caricature, beyond ecclesiastical politics. What I've found particularly helpful in Brian's work is his determination to uncover the sources and philosophical foundations of Pusey's thinking. It seems to me that unpacking the journey to a particular theological position is of critical importance if we are to have respectful, productive conversations about our differences. So Brian has shown us that the relationship between the leading figures of the Oxford movement, including Pusey, and the Romantic poets is of immense importance in understanding the evolution of what, in philosophical terms, might be called a moderate realist approach to the sacraments. All theologies have contexts. And in this instance, the 19th century Romantic movement challenged theologians not only to allow for theological knowing in categories other than reason, but to reclaim a vision of the world that recognises God's joyful engagement with creation. I believe these challenges remain pertinent to our contemporary situation. Thank you, Brian, for unpacking this for us so vividly. I want to leave plenty of space and time for questions, but before I finish, I do want to commend not only Brian's most recent book on Pusey, which is going to be for sale at the back, but also his astonishing two-volume companion to Anglican Eucharistic theology. <coughs> this apparently is, you know, the abridged version of um, Brian's wonderful um, doctoral work. I regret to say that while I knew of its existence, it's only over the last fortnight that I've had it parked on my bedside table. And what wonderful bedside reading, bedtime reading. Sadly, it's incredibly expensive. I, no, one of the reasons is that it, it's just got these lovely little snippets, which uh, Brian now tells me he was required to cut down his, his case studies. So what he does here is to survey Anglican Eucharistic theology from the Reformation to the present through this extensive series of case studies. There's analysis as well of this, but the case studies are fascinating. You name the figure and it will be there. That person will be there. From William Law to Charles Wesley, David Broughton Knox to Rome Williams. And yes, each of those is just a few pages long, which is perfect for bedtime reading. I'm uh, insisting that uh, St Mark's uh, obtain an electronic uh, copy of this for the CSU Library so that uh, this um, volume will be available again to borrow for you, for those of you that are members of uh, St Mark's Library. Brian's objective in this two-volume work accords with his objective tonight, and I just want to finish by quoting some words from uh, the early part of volume one of this wonderful work. This is what Brian has to say. This book does not advocate a particular party view, but rather argues that the discourse of Anglican Eucharistic theology is in essence multiform resting on not only a difference of theological view, but also on different philosophical assumptions. Such an approach has the potential to avoid the acrimony of particular party views, but more importantly, to present a critical interest regarding the discourse of the Anglican Eucharistic tradition, not only in terms of theology and the culture of church parties, but also in regard to the multiformity of the philosophical assumptions underlying the discourse of the tradition. In turn, this has the potential to emancipate the Anglican Eucharistic tradition 
from the specific interests of church parties and engage the discourse at a more critical level, emancipating the whole tradition to consider itself and its discourse with the greater integrity. Amen to this project and thank you, Brian, for your remarkable contribution.